Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand, this session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter con contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NYLA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at NYLA.org or you can call 800-252-6952. Retro de Detectives and Gamifying History th Through Breakout Boxes is sponsored by PLS and co-sponsored by CISL, YSS, LHRT, PCRT, and ULU. Welcome to our speakers and presenters, Karen Keyes, Jennifer Hoyer, Caitlin Holt, and Shar Johnson. I'm going to be turning it over to Caitlin now. Hello, thank you for joining Retro Detectives, gamifying history through breakout boxes. My name is Caitlin Holt and I manage Brooklyn Connections, the education division of BPL's local history archive, the Brooklyn Collection. In this role, I manage a team of staff that partner with four through 12th grade classes to teach research skills through the lens of Brooklyn history. We also offer educator professional development opportunities on incorporating and teaching with primary sources. Today, I'm presenting alongside my Brooklyn Public Library colleagues, Shar Johnson and Karen Keyes, who are going to take a moment now to personally introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Shar Johnson. I'm the project coordinator of Retro Detectives. I've spent two wonderful summers in this position, um, building the games, doing a lot of research and sourcing materials and um, also working on a cool new intern program that we just built for this summer. So yeah. Hi, I'm Karen Keyes. I am the coordinator of Young Adult Services at Brooklyn Public Library, which is part of our Youth and Family Services Department. I oversee programs and services for teens at our 60 branches. This is Caitlin, and we're here to highlight the unique ways you can use breakout boxes to deliver engaging in person and virtual programming that incorporates elements of storytelling, history, and puzzles while asking participants to problem solve and collaborate. Before we jump into the details, I'd like to share a bit of context about Retro Detectives specifically. Retro Detectives is the brainchild of two BPL departments. In my case, the school outreach arm of our special collection, and in Karen's, our Youth and Family Services Division. We were tasked by a former funder to marry the elements of two successful programs, Brooklyn Connections, which you've already heard about, and Summer Reading, a citywide initiative aimed at mitigating the summer reading slide among students through robust programming and incentives. The criteria, make it about Brooklyn history, make it intellectually stimulating, and make it available to middle schoolers and under-resourced neighborhoods. Oh, and make it fun, of course. So why Brooklyn history and how to make it engaging for teenagers? To borrow some words from the Education Alliance at Brown University, culture is center to learning. It plays a role not only in communicating and receiving information, but also in shaping the thinking process of groups and individuals. A pedagogy that acknowledges, responds to, and celebrates fundamental cultures offers full, equitable access to education for students from all cultures. So our mission in designing Retro Detectives was to help students explore a local history that connects to and amplifies the richness of their lived experiences and communities in their borough. But we couldn't just tell them the stories. We wanted them to discover them for themselves. The idea of an escape room was immediately captivating and utterly impossible. So we put our minds toward finding a solution that captured the intrigue and excitement of this immersive experience without co-opting all of our space, staff, and resources. Enter Breakout EDU, a games platform that condenses the elements of an escape room into manageable, 
physical and virtual boxes, and Shar Johnson, Retro Detectives Project Coordinator and Puzzle Master Researcher and Breakout Box Extraordinaire. In the first year of our program, Shar built four themed breakout boxes on topics ranging from the Civil Rights Movement in Brooklyn to Coney Island and Emily Roebling's Brooklyn Bridge. The games and corresponding follow-up programs were delivered by librarians at seven branches to approximately 900 young people between July and August of 2019. Shar had just concluded developing an additional four breakout boxes for the summer of 2020 when we were first forced to close down due to COVID this past March. Thankfully, Breakout EDU provides a virtual component to the physical product. So all was not lost for year two of the program. With digitized resources on hand, Shark quickly pivoted the in-person live iteration of the program to an asynchronous virtual format that summer reading participants could access and play at any time from the comfort of their home. Motivated librarians then organized virtual programming that mimicked the experience of the previous year's live version by bringing together groups of young people online to play games together. With this development, we clapped ourselves on the back and settled in for a summer. However, our ease was soon disturbed by an exciting invitation by the New York City Mayor's Office to develop a paid virtual internship for young people aged 14 through 24 to develop their own virtual retro detectives breakout boxes. Over the course of six weeks, Shar, Karen, and I walked approximately 12 motivated young people through the process of building their own virtual breakout games on a local history topic. Elements included intense puzzle solving, storytelling, research, and of course, lots and lots and lots of game playing. And let me tell you, more than a few heads were spun at the conclusion of the program when we were tasked with breaking into their virtual boxes. So what does this all look like in practice? Shar and Karen are going to walk you through the process of how to make and utilize breakout boxes for your own programs. Thank you, Caitlin. So this is Shar speaking now. Um, so what is a breakout box? It's an escape room in a box, but instead of breaking out, you are actually breaking into it, utilizing a number of locks on a box with clues. So first step in building your game is choosing what type of game will best fit your needs. Lucky for you, there are at least three different types of breakout boxes to choose from, and they all have different benefits. So there's the virtual, the physical, and DIY. I won't go into the DIY version because you can imagine that it's as easy as tape and paper clips. So let's start off by talking about the process of building a physical game, which has a lot of overlap for the virtual. The physical boxes are my favorite because I'm a very tactile person who likes to tinker with things. Here you can see it comes with a number of devices and tools to make your game super engaging. From a UV flashlight to five different types of locks, the possibilities are endless. This model does not take much more planning. This model takes a little bit more planning and time to create, set up, break down, but the payoff is second to none. Even facilitators enjoy playing these games along with the participants during the Retro Detectives program. I'd encourage you all to collaborate with other staff on building these games for the sake of time and to ensure there is a checks and balance system in place. These games can get really complex, especially when working on your own. So it's important to sit down with a pen and paper and map out each clue to their respective lock and ensure the code is attached. But if you do lose your code combination, Breakout EDU makes it really easy to reset the locks. First, you wanna sort out who your audience is as this will determine the subject, complexity, and skill set. Oftentimes you're in a mixed age group, but you may want to suggest a particular age range for certain games or programs. Once you figure out your audience, you can then move on to an age appropriate game by choosing which subject you like to engage your participants in. We gave our participants four games to choose from, Brooklyn Dodgers, Civil Rights Movement, the Brooklyn Bridge, and a neighborhood-specific one called The Mystery of the Hollow Nickel. We also suggested a middle school level age range for our program. Then it required a fair amount of research to build a believable game that adhered to a certain aesthetic and storyline. I preferred to build games where participants didn't need to come with any pre-existing knowledge as it was all right there in the clues of the game. 
That brings us to our second consideration, and that's deciding the different levels of complexity you want your game to be at. Building a non-sequential game gives players a chance to move through the game at their own pace so that they don't get stuck or feel defeated on one aspect or clue of the game. You don't want to lose your audience, so it's important to make the game fun in a challenging way. The other option, of course, is the sequential game, which is ordered in a way that allows one clue and knowledge to lead to another so it can build on itself. This might be more appropriate for older participants as it requires a bit more patience and a slightly more advanced level of critical thinking. So lastly, ensure your storylines are rock solid and engaging. This will start the game on the right foot and build the mystery and momentum up throughout the game. Utilize your archive, talk with inclusive services, include and recruit other members of staff. It's more fun that way. I also use Pinterest, YouTube, Google, et cetera, um, are all resources to assist you with your build out. I was also able to source out a lot of handmade decoders and props from independent craftspeople outside of Amazon. Here you can see a condensed version of one of our physical boxes. So now let's talk about virtual games. There are a number of ways to build a virtual game, but for now we'll talk about the ones you can utilize on Breakout EDU. It's fairly inexpensive compared to the physical version and it's much more accessible to people who may not be able to make it to the program. You have access to a lot of free digital games that educators much like ourselves have created. Playing their games gives you great ideas on how to approach yours, whether it's the theme or the clues you're designing. There are over 300 games to choose from that range from primary to secondary age groups, all the way up to workplace for enhancing team building skills. So maybe this program might even be, a good, be good for building morale at your library. If you wanna create both a digital and physical game, it's also fairly easy to translate your physical boxes to digital boxes. The website layout of Breakout EU is less intuitive than building the actual game on their site, but in my experience, the Breakout EDU support team is worth having on your side. Navigating the site takes some getting used to, but you're not only paying for great customer service, but a number of great tools. There are great tutorials on the site to walk you through the step-by-step -step process of building your game in a way that will be engaging, fun, and educational. So here are two main things to keep in mind when designing the digital boxes. You'll need a site to host your virtual meetups. We started with Google, but had to quickly pivot to Zoom as it had more to offer our particular program and our participants seem more versed in it. So what Google couldn't offer us in our meeting space, they made up for with Google Slides and Google Drive. These two tools are very useful when building your game. Google Slides allows you to add clues like text, color, shape, et cetera, before uploading it to the platform. Here's the one clue built in Google Slides for the curious case of the hollow nickel. You have to understand the pig pen cipher in order to solve it. Take a moment to see if you understand how it works. All right, next you see here, we've added some red direction arrows as clues to unlock the directional lock. Lastly, we have to decode the riddle to answer the clue. This was all done in Google Slides for layout purposes, and then a screenshot of the image was taken and uploaded to Breakout EDU. Now you have Google Drive, which gives you a chance to store resources for the game, for instance, hint cards, images, fail safes for your locks, and other things you may want to add to the game. So Google Drive and Slides picks up the limitations that you sometimes encounter on Breakout EDU platform. Overall, just have fun building it, and I'm sure participants will too. Now Karen will walk you through the last steps.
You've created your game with a mix of history, storytelling, and problem solving, but how will you play the game? While our virtual games are hosted on the Breakout EDU website, players access the links from our Retro to Texas page on our library's website. So anyone can click the links and start a game. The modules are designed for a middle school audience, but really anyone eight and older can experience the fun. Solo play is the first option. We shared the virtual games through a summer reading challenge and youth could explore the clues on their own. We promoted it through social media and also email newsletters. But the previous summer, when we played with actual boxes and actual locks, we hosted 30 to 45 minute programs as groups of four to six players. Our branches each had four boxes and some even opted to host camp groups. This can add an extra element of competition which group will solve the puzzles first. While solo play means anyone with a device and a connection can play anytime, the three of us are strong advocates for group play. When a group plays one of the Retro Detectives games, you can offer a more complex game with additional clues. If someone is stuck or frustrated by a clue, another person can jump in. Some people might excel at one type of clue while others prefer another. I love clues where the answer is in the photograph or the document and I just need to look closely to find the answer. I absolutely hate clues that involve decoding. When we get to playing a game, you will see what I mean. Just as there are different types of clues, there are different types of locks. Number, letter, directional, color. You might even find you have a favorite type of lock unsurprising for the library profession, I dig the letter locks, which normally spell a word. For the virtual version, you can offer a mix of the two. You can play as a group on a platform like Zoom, and each person moves through the game individually, but can unmute or hop into the chat if they need help. This could also be replicated in a computer lab or at a school where everyone has their own device. I'm gonna talk about some of the ways we prepared staff to lead or host games and some of the things we wish we had told staff the first time around. Obviously, you might be the staff training yourself. Um, you might be from a smaller library. Obviously, Brooklyn Public Library is a very big system. So these are things to keep in mind for yourself or whether or not you're training a group. What to cover in a training? Play the game. Definitely need to practice. Provide the answers to the clues and the solution to the locks. If uh, you're playing a physical game in person, obviously that's on hold for a bit now, practice setting the locks. There's lots of YouTube videos to help out with this also. Warn staff that setup and cleanup will take as long as the program, if not longer. This is important to keep in mind for desk schedules. The first year we created a manual that included the framing story as well as the answers to each of the locks and how to arrive at that solution. We also posted this to our internal wiki. Make sure in the training you have fun with puzzles and riddles. We provided a wooden puzzle box for one of the games to be played in our branches. The box held the decoder rings that would be necessary to solve clues. Staff needed time to practice opening the puzzle box and needed to understand it well enough to give future players hints. The number one thing we wish we had stressed with staff was lock maintenance. Keep a record of the combination each lock is set to, especially if you are playing more than one module at a time. It is also advised to keep the locks in an open position. If you have staff leading games at multiple locations, give them a way to talk to each other, email, Slack, or by scheduling regular meetings where they can chat. To get your players ready to tackle a game, you can supplement the program with brain teasers, riddles, or other mind games. This can have the added benefit of breaking the ice between players who might not have known each other previously. Some of our staff like to use the one minute mystery book series as well as two minute and five minute mysteries. There is also a ton of riddles and brain teasers you can find online. 
this type of activity works whether you're in person or doing a virtual game. As previously referenced, this year we hosted youth interns. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a program where youth ages 14 to 24 learned how to make their own games. While we ran this as an internship, it could also be adjusted as a program series in a public library or an ongoing, ongoing unit in an educational setting. For something like this, you want either a captive or extremely consistent group. This summer, we had a group of about a dozen interns that were paid by the mayor's office. Over six weeks, the youth learned about history, research, storytelling, and game design. We started by introducing them to the games we had created, as well as games on the Breakout EDU platform. In order to build their own games, they would need to understand the components. Each game starts with a framing story, so we knew storytelling would be important. We talked about the components of good story and did lots of writing exercises. Similarly, research and history were important. Since Retro Detectives is rooted in history, and the material and in our archives, we provide an instruction about how to do research. The interns had four topic areas to build their game around. Neighborhood history, civil rights in Brooklyn, Jackie Robinson, and transportation. Limiting the topic meant we could create mini archives for each topic. Um, the slide here shows our sort of mini archive for the transportation topic where our interns could pick and choose what images or files they might want to use in their game. Next, we focused on game design. Game design was a little trickier to teach, but Breakout EDU has lots of resources. We decided one of the best ways to learn game design was to play tons of games where interns could experience the different types of locks and clues. As the program went on, we had less structured activity and more independent time for the youth to work on their games. We gave feedback and assistance as needed. We finished the summer with a virtual pizza party where we sent each of the interns their very own pizza. Now it's time to see it in action. Let's play a game. Hi, so here we are with the uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and the missing good luck charm. So here we have the storyline. The Brooklyn Bridge is under construction and Chief Engineer Washington Roebling has taken ill. He has developed caseland disease and is bedridden for an indefinite amount of time. His wife, Emily Roebling, is the only person allowed to see him and has taken over relaying information from her husband to his assistant. While Mr. Roebling recovers, Emily has stepped in to the role as chief engineer to ensure the completion of the bridge. The bridge is almost complete and she needs our help. They've sent 21 elephants over the bridge to prove its strength and durability. But Mrs. Roebling wants to be the first person to cross the bridge before its official opening. The only problem is she's lost her good luck charm. The poor rooster was stolen from the Roebling's house late last night. The burglars, get it, left some evidence on their way out. We need to find the rooster stat or else the bridge won't open. Detectives, grab your thinking caps and let's save Brooklyn Bridge's celebration and the rooster, of course. So. Here we have our different locks that 
that you can put in. Some are directional, some are um, a number, and some are text locks. There's all different ones. There's also shapes um, that, that you can also choose from. So here's our first clue, and you can see down here the combination is three numbers that are needing to be input. Here is um, a little invitation that was sourced from the archive. And um, so the clue is over here and it says, being on time for a party is difficult when you are short one number, but it's perfect for a simple lock. So here we have this beautiful invitation. Anybody want to guess where we go? We are guessing in the chat. So okay. Two or I mean, four, four or five, two, two. Two oh four, you said. Yeah. Okay. Bummer. Five, five, five two, two, two. Okay. So where uh, did those come from? Um, five, two, four. Five two four. Okay, five two four. Well, well we, we suck at this. Um, <laughs> you just started. No, um, so this is a great opportunity. So, like, it, <laughs> it's always good to have hints in mind when you're playing. And so, you know, what we would do is refer people back to the clue to give a hint. So it says short one number but it also says time. So we would say, what is the time in the invitation and what number would you like to take away? One, one, three. Wow, got that quick. Let's okay. try it. Yeah, let's see. Oh, yay. <laughs> nice. nice. Oh man, this looks complicated. <laughs> so this is this Karen's is my favorite. least favorite type <laughs> of blue. I hate it. Stop here, keep going. So as we- it's really go ahead go ahead karen no it's Bye. really fun when you're playing this type of clue in person because we had actual decoder rings it's a little less fun online um but it it works out better when you have sort of a large group and you can divvy up the different parts um, yeah this is going to take us a very long time to decode what? so <laughs> like a lot I thought you Oh, and typically you don't need to decode all of it. Maybe just the first three, four words or. Okay. What runs? What runs? <laughs> that, you, you all got that really quick. <laughs> are we are we entering a number or letters? But what this runs? But you can tell it's a letter lock because up at the top it says A B C. Oh, okay. What runs? It's We're not. Six, it's not. Ne Nell. It's river. Wow. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Oh wow. <laughs> so if if you had decoded the whole thing, what the what it e is equal to the actual riddle is what runs but never walks has a mouth but cannot talk has a head but doesn't think, has a bed but doesn't sleep. So as you know, the answer is river. And sometimes um, you do have trouble with this clue. And the cool thing about the game is you can like sort of refer them back to the picture. Like, well, what do you see? Is is what you see in this picture? Is it is it possible that that's part of the answer too? And there's the bridge and the river. So hopefully that leads people to it. Okay. Okay, A plus B equals a key. What could it be made out of? A plus B equals a key. It's 11? A plus B. Oh. Of, in the, what? what? B. <laughs> Remember to look at the lock to see what kind of lock uh, you're trying to find the answer to. So this one, this one is sometimes too one you have to kind of like blow up if you're on a computer. Um, it's 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 written with invisible ink in the physical game, um, but on a computer it's a little bit harder to see. 
see. Um, but as Shara is making it bigger, you can kind of see certain numbers, right? So what numbers do you see? 23, 26, and 6. Or six, 23, 6, 6, 26, and 14. See? That guy's falling exactly. to Exactly. That's interesting. See? Do you see the guy dying? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is probably one where the picture might be a little less important. Um, so basically, <laughs> each of the numbers is going to refer to a letter down below. Um, it's not in order, though. It's scrambled. So you'll have to... Okay. Figure so, out what each of the letters is and unscramble it. Okay. So it's S E E T L T L C T L. Just to remind participants, whether in person or online, that it's handy to have a piece of paper and a pen handy. What? Yeah. And um. It, we we realized this pretty early on too when we started doing the physical game so we bought these little mini whiteboards so people could sort of work out things six um, t and l what could it be made of is the deal oh there we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's why it's nice for the little hint cards to come into play you know um okay so here's our last one okay it took us six or seven years yes. for anybody to remember from the day of the invitation better late than never um okay so maybe it took six months for a name to be remembered from the day, day of invitation so we're back at 52283 for a name or five two two I don't, I don't know wait oh 67 years for her name to be remembered from the day of the invitation oh so we have to add 67 to 1883 gotcha all right i'm on the page <laughs> five we're doing some math hold on 1950 i don't know let's see yes. wow we did it. <laughs> also, she was the first one across the bridge. What about the rooster, though? The rooster and her. Oh, oh, oh have the rooster. Oh, okay. Do you, is there a picture of her carrying the rooster? No, but we did have a rooster at the end to kind of say, "Yay, you got the rooster!" And then no, so yeah. Do yeah, we when we played. The physical game with the actual boxes there's a tiny box that goes within the bigger breakout box and we stuffed a stuffed rooster into the tiny box so once you open the last box which is you know set to 1950 um the youth found a actual rooster so oh wow okay fun great so i'm going to stop showing my screen now and thank you all for playing with us. No, that was fun. <laughs> Steel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. Yeah, we're so smart. Let <laughs> The funny thing, too, is like sometimes when adults play the games, they overthink certain things that like that kids and teens don't necessarily do. So it, it, yeah. it, we've we've done this a lot in a lot of trainings just to, you know, introduce it to to staff. And it, it is sometimes really funny to like watch <laughs> people like go to really strange places with the clue when, you know, it's just, you know, the shortest line is normally between A and yeah. B. So. Yeah, we're, we overthink things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you guys did great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. thanks. So what what are the, um, the, the kids who play it, what sort of feedback have you gotten from them? They've all really enjoyed it, actually, especially the physical version of the game. That was really successful. I think I think that the online game was was really great too but i guess we really only had um the internship to really see that part of it and not the kind of uh individual games um at the library 
at least I, I, I didn't see that part of it. So did you guys one get thing a we like? Yeah, we did. It was part of, we got, we got money from um, a foundation for summer reading in general, but they specifically wanted us to do a project like this. So we developed it with that. Um, but the thing I like to tell people when people ask about youth playing it is um, at one point we were sort of, we wanted to do a photo session where we wanted to take a group, uh, we want to take photos of a group of kids like playing and we decided to do it during um, a normal program where where youth play video games and just sort of kind of in the back of the room. And like we were able to lure like these teens and tweens away from like video games and they totally got into it. Um, I think what's really fun about it is it is so collaborative and it's it's also a way to sort of like have a deeper connection with the players because you're almost always playing with like a small group of people or you're dividing into groups that are small groups so they can like really get into it it's not like a craft where you do a demo and then everyone kind of just does their own thing it's like something where everybody can do it together yeah cool this is caitlin um i would like to interject that if if you wanted to try to replicate that um, camaraderie in a virtual setting um, of course, you would need a few facilitators, but you could schedule a Zoom meeting and have uh, the young people sign on and then and then break them into breakout groups or breakout rooms, I should say, um, with an adult moderator in each room so that they could still um, collaborate on the game as a group. Um, our, our young people were really great at sharing hints with one another as they would figure out the answers. And then, um, and then of course, you could still compete amongst the other breakout rooms to see who could actually crack the game first. Fun. Thanks guys, this is really great. Thank you. Does anybody have any further questions that we can answer about any um, aspects of making breakout um, game programming? Mm, not right now. Okay, well, well, thank you all for joining us today. If anybody would like more information um, about what we've presented on, you can contact us personally. Our details are here on the screen. And we also have our game still live on the Brooklyn Public Library website. So if you would actually like to try to solve more games on your own, we, we recommend that you visit bklynlibrary.org. Um, and actually, you could just do backslash, slash, backslash retro detectives. Um, to find those games. Thank you all so much. Um, this concludes the NYLA 2020 On Demand program, Retro Detective and Gamifying History through break, Breakout Boxes. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on demand and live programs the NYLA 2020 Annual Virtual Conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make, make this the best conference ever. All right, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>